there, dearest viewer. Welcome, welcome. Please do sit down, have some tea, take a break from reviewing your miniatures, and enjoy the first episode of the Neverland Book Club. Tis I, Lady Whistledown, and the unmistakable and expensive expensive royal voice of Julie Andrews. The hills are alive indeed with this week's debut topic of discussion, The Duke and I by Julia Quinn. Wait, that's not what it's called? Ah, yes, Bridgerton, the musical. Not a musical. Yet. It's not a musical yet, but it's coming. Emily Abigail, darlings, please do hurry and give the people what they want. And if you were to need anything at all, <laughs> my Los Angeles door is always open. I don't know what I would do for you, but if you need a camera crew or anything. Ah, such talented, genius young ladies, those two. Makes me so proud. Anywho, let's get back to the show, as this author has much to share with you, dearest viewer. So if you've binged Bridgerton on Netflix like we all have, and are interested in the book, but don't really have the time or patience to sit through a novel, uh, <laughs> I did it for you. And as always, spoilers ahead. I thought it no better time to start this brand new channel than with the period piece that's steaming up the screens of everyone I know, Bridgerton, the newest addition to the Shondaland land. If you don't know what I'm talking about, how? Shonda Rhimes is responsible for shows such as Grey's Anatomy, <laughs> Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder, and Station 19. All shows hosted by the family safe ABC network, except, <laughs> no. Not this one. This one is on Netflix. That's right, Shonda Darling, you finally have the freedom to show what we're all really interested in and you've spared no opportunity to do so. <laughs> A lot of butts. <laughs> Your audience thanks you greatly. I'll be rewatching Ray J. Jean Page gallop into town while in a bubble bath with some chilled wine and essential oils called self-care. <laughs> now I have quite an obsessive personality and uh, I may need therapy. <laughs> but when a period piece comes along, I am obsessed by default. Anything with Keira Knightley, I just love it. So when I sat down to watch Bridgerton for the first time and saw it was based on a set of novels, novels, <laughs> on a set of novels, I had to just submerge myself into an even deeper void immediately. And so I did, yes. I read The Duke and I so you don't have to. But you probably should, because it really is just a captivating and delightful and juicy, juicy story. Just as juicy as the show. The Duke and I is book one of nine in Julia Quinn's Bridgerton series, published in January of 2000. Each book tells the coming of age slash coming of society story of each of the eight Bridgerton children, all famously named in alphabetical order. The ninth book is a set of second epilogues for the previous stories, as well as a look into the life of Violet, Mama Bridgerton. Julia Quinn does an exquisite job of analyzing the tropes of class society in the early 1800s and how they parallel with the concept of social status today. Family names, royalty, legacies, titles, fashion, marriage, it's all for show! Similarly today with social media, celebrities, dating sites, reality television, religious communities, YouTubers, <laughs> what have you, we're all just putting on a show. Nothing is real. The world of women specifically is explored in The Duke and I, since it is the telling of Daphne's love story. Women were only as valuable as the man they could attract for marriage. Rising her family's name and station, inheriting a dowry that would automatically go to the man that owns her, etc. You know, just girly things. Daphne, however, is searching for a love match among the many bachelors of the season. Something more than just an acceptable or advantageous marriage contract. How boring. She desires a bit of <laughs> spice. That's where Simon comes in, on his horse. The opening prologue of The Duke and I narrates the birth of Simon Bassett, the Earl of Hastings, which, as we all know, had its own tragic elements. Young Simon knew nothing more than the life of an outcasted yet still quite fortunate orphan for lack of a better phrase. The abuse of his father is lasting in its emotional effects. We know he never got the chance to actually physically abuse Simon since he stood up for his little self, but his strike is there all the same, with his denying that his son is even alive as well as his indifference towards the death of his wife during Simon's birth. Horrible man. The story touches on forms of masculinity, be it from the time period, social, political, and so on. But here is where it made my heart hurt. The, most. the relationship between father and son had nothing to do with kinship and everything to do with the Hastings name, 
the dukedom. Simon's reluctance to speak is perhaps a take on him being silenced by the title he carries. He as a person is not what matters to his father. It is only his name that is of any value. Simon's letters to his father go unanswered, his need for parental affection ignored. As readers, we are aware of his vow to never have children, to ensure the Hastings name ends with his death, even before we're introduced to the Bridgerton family. Simon's majestic arrival back to London in the wake of his father's death just quakes the young ladies of the town as well as their mothers, as he is the most desired bachelor in town despite his reputation as a, a rake. <laughs> Meanwhile, Daphne is preparing for the first ball of the season. In desperate need of a spotlight to make it out of every man's friend zone. We get right into the good stuff pretty early on in the novel. I thought it would have to wait for Simon and Daphne's little bump into each other. Oh, I'm sorry, who are you? You mean to tell me you don't know who I am, little, you know, meet cute moment. But uh, Lady Quinn doesn't like to leave a girl waiting. Their meeting was rather different, and I'd say even better in the novel. You know the scene where Daphne straight punches Nigel in the nose for forgetting what the word no means? Yeah, that's where Simon sees her for the first time. Thinking he was going to have to save a damsel in distress from a drunken, less than gentle man. He is impressed, of course, and perhaps a little oh, turned on by her righteous standing. He emerges from the shadows and offers to help Daphne with her current predicament. <laughs> It wasn't until learning her name did he realize Daphne was the younger sister of his good friend Antony, and he was already lusting over her. My god. I was both surprised and incredibly relieved that Daphne punched Nigel herself in both the novel and the show. Because even well-born ladies in ball gowns and corsets can throw a good KO if need be. And so their mutually advantageous relationship flourishes. There is, however, one other person that is in the know, Daphne's eldest brother, Antony, as he goes along with the charade in Daphne's best interest. I did like how they left this detail out in the show. It added a bit of uh, that sweet, sweet forbidden fruit aspect to the thing. It's described in the novel Daphne is not yet 20 and has been out in society for two years with some proposals but none of great excitement, and therefore remains to be seen in the tone as just a friendly girl and not that of marital repute. Which is why she is in need of the ruse in the first place. While in the show, Daphne is rather taken with the idea of marrying during her very first season to set the tone for the rest of her sisters, she's still holding out for love. There's also an emphasis in the first half of the first episode of how important her debut to society is, as she is deemed by the Queen as flawless, my dear. Come to find, Queen Charlotte isn't even a character in the novels, but we'll get to that in a minute. Their scheme to faux court is concocted, and there you have it. Wait. Wait, I've read, I've read this before. Oh yes, there, and there, and that one too, yes, mm-hmm, yes. So it's not that original, so what? You're gonna let that get in the way of an otherwise juicy story? Enemies to Lovers has been done a million times, but I'll still read and read and read if there's enough steam emanating from the pages. Also, this is Gossip Girl. Their growth from quarreling acquaintances to requited accomplices to good friends to husband and wife and then to lovers is much more gradual and natural in the show than in the novel, I found. In the novel, Simon is lusting over Daphne before even knowing her name, and Daphne is constantly looking for him in every ballroom she enters. Oh. Their feelings cannot be hidden under the light of the omniscient narrator, and is therefore a bit less satisfying when they finally do reach the realization of their affections towards one another. When they do finally kiss in the maze and are found out by Antony, sealing their fates, <laughs> the show actually had a rather PG take on this scene. In the novel, Simon is undressing Daphne, as she is horrified that her brother has seen her in such a compromised manner. And then Antony's all like, my best friend is my sister. <laughs> I felt this event is perhaps a commentary based on the analogy of gender. The men resort to violence to solve their differences by means of a duel in the name of honor over a woman. <laughs> Basic. Said woman comes in and is like, yo, guys, <laughs> why you gotta act all emotional? And then there's a wedding, so. Men. <laughs> so now here's where the story becomes a little funny. If you could call keeping women completely ignorant the capabilities of their bodies so as to preserve their innocence and hiding the nature of child making funny. So I've seen many memes and TikToks pop up lately that just give me the giggles because of the simple notion that Daphne doesn't know what 
happens when a man finishes. And Simon being all, oh, I can't come in you, my daddy was mean to me. Again, another instance of unnecessary action taking the place of communication to solve some deep-rooted trauma. Drama in general, tragedies versus comedies, whatever the genre, all stems from some form of miscommunication. In this story, there is a lack of communication from all sides. Daphne's mother fails to explain to her the mechanics of her own body and the details behind conception before she's married, and Simon has trouble distinguishing between cannot and will not. <laughs> when it comes to the context behind his life choices. My scruples with Violet is of course keeping young girls uneducated and simply ignorant to preserve their innocence, and that just makes me... Yeah. <laughs> and with Simon, I mean, it's not like he doesn't eventually tell Daphne about his father anyway, so why not start there first without this whole roundabout thing? But then I suppose we wouldn't have the juicy story we have here, now would we? After the young couple learn to articulate their needs and desires towards one another, they have kids! Plural, actually. Spoiler. Because Simon finally realizes with some help that allowing his father's past and the Hastings name to dictate his present life and future was just silly. So silly. Making yourself and your wife miserable so you can win against a dead man? Silly. Silly, Simon. Simon says don't be silly. Ugh. Some other notable additions to the show that were not present in the novel were characters such as Sienna Russo, a talented and independent opera singer who puts Antony in his place about owning yet another woman, just to trap her under his name and station. Her character is fierce, strong, talented, and underappreciated, in my opinion. I wanted to see more of her asserting her dominance over weak-kneed Antony. And honestly, she made his character a lot more tolerable. As mentioned, Queen Charlotte is also an added figure of royal class. I have heard some whining voices circulating around the idea that a queen of her appearance would never be in a position of such power, and I say to those mosquitoes, shut up! SWAT. Queen Charlotte is dominant, intimidating, unquestionable, and basically Shonda Rhimes, personified in an 1800s powdered wig. She occasionally mentions her husband, the king, but we don't see him that often. We do get a hint when a servant says he's lucid at some point, after which we see his erratic behavior suggesting an existence of some form of dementia, perhaps? Queen Charlotte protects his name by keeping him in the shadows, or is she keeping him as some form of a prisoner? No, no I don't think so. At first the mention of his name suggests penance in her face, yet when in his presence she presents with pity and sadness. I guess we'll just have to wait till season two, which is confirmed. By the way. Another added character is Prince Friedrich. Friedrich? Friedrich? Frigidaire? Frigidaire? <laughs> oh, he responded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that whole making Simon jealous by seducing the foreign prince bit was all Shonda Rhimes and Chris Van Dussen. They do love a good seduction. My fan! Lord Featherington is also an addition, yet hardly notable. In the novel, he's dead. Not just a dead beat, he's dead. In the show, he's basically just a means to an end, really, and who noticed when he was on screen, because I hardly did. Madame Delacroix, the dressmaker, is another CEO added character who helped another Bridgerton brother seem interesting. Not only is she a single, self-liberated, business-owning, talented dressmaker and person of color, she's also juggling a secret identity. She knows how society works, and she intends to work the system to her own advantage, and I can respect that. Marina Thompson's story is also an added plot. Although her character is, in the novels, as a distant cousin of the Bridgertons and not Featheringtons, and she is also tied to the Cranes, her story is much more tragic and brief. In the show, Marina's story trifled to expose Lady Featherington's character, and the extent her family would go to to stay relevant within the tongue. Her predicament really shows the importance of appearance above all else in the eyes of society. If Marina had been a character in a novel or show set in today's time, she would be relatable, perhaps pitied even. Losing her love to a war and being left to bear his child, shunned by her family, I'd like to see what happens with her storyline in the next season. One of my favorite characters outside the Tawn was that of Will Mondrick. Cause there's just nothing sexier than a strong yet gentle family man and loyal friend with a heart of gold and arms of steel. His character was actually based off of a real boxer of color, Bill Richmond. 
His character is focused on providing for his wife, who he actually has a true affinity for, not just that of title. A concept the nobles of the Taun have yet to evolve to comprehend. Fans of book series are notorious for nitpicking what an adaptation decides to add or leave out. I've shared my opinion. What's yours? I'd very much like to know. So, there you have it. You can read The Duke and I on Kindle, Audible, or paperback, but good luck finding a hardcover copy for under $900. Because last time I checked, TikTok just ruined that for everyone. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. If you enjoyed this video, please give it an I enjoyed it button tickle. And please do subscribe for much more to come. This is a brand new channel, baby channel, focused on the literary arts, so be gentle. <laughs> well, I'm off to go write my future daughter a full textbook on the anatomy and conception of biological human life, so stay lost, keep reading, educate your children. Oh my god. Hey, husband. My dear Duke of Los Angeles. Do you burn for me? Do you burn for me? Would you like to fill up my dance card with only your name? It's more than two dances and that would just be a scandal. And we can give Whistledown something to really write about. <laughs> okay, goodbye! Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay, now I'm complete. I burn for you!